Hello interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Uh, slightly odd format today, I'm going to be um, uh, working on this iMac on my standing desk. Um, and we're going to be replacing the hard drive in it with an SSD and transferring all of the data across and all the rest of it. I'm going to show you the whole procedure from beginning to end. Very useful um, thing to do if you own an iMac like this, one of these slimline ones, uh, and it doesn't have an SSD, you should put an SSD in it. Uh, and if you're a repair shop, you should learn this repair because right now I do very well doing this repair on a regular basis. So yeah, very, very worth knowing how to do this and not being afraid of them because they are a bit scary if you haven't worked on them. Now, I have actually done one of these on the channel before. Um, it was like the second one I'd ever done. I was still learning the procedure and the video wasn't very good. Uh, the video has, I've actually privated the video quite some time ago because um, it caused a little bit of a stir at the time because I was, instead of looking up how to do it, I was trying to figure it out because that's kind of my style is rather than researching something and and just copying a tutorial, I like to look at things and figure them out and I try to encourage other people to do the same because looking at something and figuring it out is how you learn to fix things. There's not always going to be a tutorial and it builds that troubleshooting mindset as such. However, there are some times where that just doesn't work. And that's kind of what happened when the last time I looked at one of these, I was like, oh, I'm just going to buy some double-sided tape. We'll just double-sided tape that screen back on. Um, and yeah, the finish wasn't very good. And I privated the video as a result because I didn't think it was representative and it was not something that I wanted other people to follow suit with. Incidentally, the customer in question with that, I did the job on the cheap for them. And we had agreed this in advance. I'd said, look, it's going to be a bit rough because I'm learning these. And he said, that's fine. I want cheap. Um, and we were per everyone was perfectly happy with it. However, it's not something I wanted to do for looking forward. Anyway, let's move on and start working on this. So um, this one starts and runs is just very slow. And that this is the complaint that I hear from everyone when they call up. They say, I've got an Apple Mac desktop. And I'm like, cool, it's not. And they go, it's very slow. And I'm like, cool, it needs an SSD. So while we're working on this, we will test the hard drive to see if it's failing. However, it doesn't actually matter if the hard drive is failing. It's a hard drive. It's terrible. Rip it out. So first of all, if the iMac does start and run, um, fire it up and just check what its status is. Check what version of macOS it's running. Um, check like how much data is how much uh, data is actually on the device. How much storage is in use. Um, and have a look to see what kind of software is there, specifically in terms of old versions of Adobe Creative Suite, old versions of Microsoft Office and things like that, because that might impact how you do this repair, assuming you're working on someone else's computer. And that's always the perspective I'm coming from when doing repairs, is I'm working on other people's computers, so I don't know what they've got on their computer. And I have to figure out and use my judgment as to what I think is the best course of action for their computer. So this particular iMac, it is already running um, macOS Monterey, which is, as, as of recording this video, the latest version of macOS. So we're going to be putting macOS Monterey on here. One of the things that I'm looking out for is specifically, if they're running an older version of macOS, you might say, well, we want to upgrade them to a newer version of macOS. Watch out for people who have old versions of Creative Suite or old versions of Microsoft Office, specifically Office 2011. Because Office 2011, nine time, I don't know if there was a 64-bit version of it, but pretty much anyone who's running Office 2011 will probably have the 32-bit version of that. And macOS Catalina onwards does not run 32-bit apps. So if you see that the client's computer has Office 2011 on there, you're going to have to make sure they stay on Mojave, or you're going to have to agree that they need to upgrade their version of Office, which obviously, as you understand, is going to be more complications. So be careful about blasting Mac, uh, a brand new version of macOS onto someone's computer and then having them come back in and go, Office doesn't work anymore. Um, this one does not have any such issues. It's got a modern version of Office on there. Um, and it's already running Monterey. In terms of storage, um, this has a one terabyte hard drive in it, and uh, they are not using, as you can see, they're using uh, maybe uh, just over a quarter, maybe a third of it. We could fit a 500 gig SSD to this. We could get away with that to keep the cost down. However, I've already agreed with this customer that we're gonna put a one terabyte in there as a fit and forget approach. 
So we're going to put a one terabyte in there and it's the last SSD this thing will ever need. And we're going to start off by removing the front screen. So the, the screen is glued on on these slimline Macs. If you've got one of the old thick by ones with a DVD drive, completely different animal. Um, this video will not apply in any useful imagination. So to remove this screen, you're going to need some kind of removal tool. Um, I, in the past, I have tried using Stanley blades and things like that. They're not very good for this, to be honest. You need a specific tool. So you either need one of those pizza slices or like box cutter style things that you can get from places like iFixit. Or what I've got is, I've got this, I don't know what you call this, um, it's, it's like a shim or something. But as you can see, it's literally just a slip of metal. It's just a flexible slip of metal like that. Um, uh, this one's got phone fix written on it. And I got this in some repair kit at some point. Um, but because it's metal, it can behave like a blade and cut through adhesive strips. But it's thin enough and flexible enough that it gets right into the tiniest gaps. So... Um, this is also good because it makes it very easy for me to gauge depth. We don't want to cut in too deep. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in only by about, I don't know, 10, maybe 12 millimeters or so. And what I tend to do is put my finger and thumb just on the edge to limit how deep I can cut in with this so I don't accidentally go in deep. And so I'm just going to put my th finger and thumb like about there. So we've got just under 10 mil or so to allow for squidginess. And I'm just going to slip that into the top here, like that. And I'm just going to start cutting in. And we're just going to come down one side of the screen. And I can just feel that cutting through the adhesive tape. And because my finger and thumb are there, I can't accidentally go in too deep and potentially damage the screen. So I'm going to go over that a second time. And then I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to go along the top. And when we get to the middle, there'll be a slight bump as I go past the camera. And then I'm going to go down the side. There we go. So now I've done that, I'm just going to get my fingernails in the top and just see if I can pry that off. That's not moving at the moment, so I need to cut more. I haven't gone deep enough, so let's go in a bit deeper. And I'm just feeling it out, basically. I'm just feeling to see if I'm cutting still. There's still more to cut. I was too shallow. And I'll go down the side again. And now I'll... Just have another look. I'm turning it round to face the camera just so you can see when it starts coming out. Coming out. No, I'm still still being too gentle. Apparently, go around again. So now we've got a gap forming, and what I need to do is I just need to start just again, just coming in again and just feeling out any bits that I've missed. If you have one of these like magic pizza slice tools, this will be a lot easier. I'm making this look harder than it actually is because I'm trying to do it for the camera. Uh, normally when I'm doing this off camera, I just go and the screen comes off. However, of course, while I'm recording it, it's being difficult with me. I'll go across the top again. Get the other side. There's still a lot to cut down there. I'm, I can feel a lot of tape still. Turn that around slightly. So now we've done this much, we've got a big old gap that is forming and you can just pull it out enough to just see where it's still holding on. So now we've got this much, I can just go around and just nick any bits that are still holding on. So this side is done now. All right, are we good to go yet? There we go. So there you can see, that's what I wanted to show you. You can just see a little bit where I need to cut in just a bit more. This is what I'm looking for now. And that is ready to go. So now we're going to pull that screen forward. Just tilting it carefully forward and we're going to look down and we're going to see here and here 
where there's two cables holding on. And we'll just disconnect those. They're both locking, so you've got to squeeze the sides together and flip the levers out. You'll see what I mean when you get there. There's one. And lever. There's the other one. So that's the screen now disconnected, and I'm just going to keep carefully tilting it forward because we're still glued along the bottom. And we're just peeling that off. And now we're down low enough. There's a pull tab here, you can just see. And there's another one ooh, there. I'm just going to grab those pull tabs and rip off that adhesive strip. Not all of it will come off, but the more of it you get off, the easier this bit gets. There we go. So I've just left a tiny bit at the bottom, and now I can literally just hook that off like that. And that's our screen removed. So I'll put this somewhere safe. Right, so now our screen is off, we've exposed the inside, you can see the horror that is this hard drive. So it's a two and a half inch laptop hard drive, which is why it's so unbelievably slow. Um, and then the other things of note that are here, um, the, the memory modules are behind the logic board. And, and if you want to change those memory modules, you will need to remove the logic board. This is basically a matter of disconnect all the cables around the outside, unscrew the speaker modules. Um, you basically need to start taking chunks of the computer out. Um, it's, a f <laughs> it's not impossible. Um, it's mainly just unscrewing and removing stuff. It's a bit of a jigsaw, a bit of a Tetris puzzle to do. So I'm not going to demonstrate it in this video. What we're going to go for, though, is just the hard drive itself. So let's start by removing that hard drive. So for this bit, you're going to need a T10. And we're just going to undo these four bolts on each side. All right, now we can move these two little retaining plastic bits and the hard drive will just pop out like so and it's got a connector at the back so we'll just unplug it from there there we go and there's our hard drive so these hard drives are just bog standard laptop hard drives as I mentioned they're not particularly interesting we do want to peel off these rubber bumpers from the side we can reuse these so I'll just peel that off. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to stick this guy on test. Um, now there's um, there's no, I'm not aware of any particularly good hard drive testing utilities for MacOS. So I'm going to plug this into a Windows computer to test it. We don't need to be able to read the contents of the drive in order to do a diagnostic test because a bog standard sector scan uh, doesn't involve actually reading the data. It just involves polling each sector of the drive and measuring how long it takes that sector to respond. If the sector does not respond or takes a certain amount of time to respond, say above 50 milliseconds, we assume that the sector is bad. And any bad sectors mean the drive is deteriorating, which means it's failing. To connect the drive up to another computer, the easiest way is to have something like this in your arsenal. So um, this is a hard drive enclosure, two and a half inch hard drive enclosure. It adapts a SATA connection to a USB 3 connection. And uh, I've got a more desktop oriented version of one of these that takes three and a half inch desktop drives as well, connected up to my, um, my testing rig. Um, but having a couple of these kicking around is always very handy. They're like 10 pounds on Amazon. This particular one is made by a company called Eluteng, E-L-U-T-E-N-G. Um, these ones are really good in my opinion. They're like seven quid. There is a cover that goes over the top of it, but I just don't have it to hand. And I've left the cellophane on because they get scratched up super easily. Um, and uh, yeah, these are really good. I keep these in stock um, for just giving, for just converting hard drives into external hard drives to give to a customer if I'm giving them their old data back to them or something like that. It's a really good way of presenting it and it looks cool. 
Um, so now I can just plug this into a Windows computer and I use CTools for Windows for testing a hard drive. Uh, it's not the most verbose software for this, but it's very simple to use and it will just do a short generic and or a long generic test and just say this drive is good or this drive has failed. And that's basically all you need to know. So I'll go and plug this in and we'll put it on test just for curiosities. Uh, and while we do that, we'll then go and clean, we'll clean up the iMac and prepare it for our SSD. So this iMac is actually in pretty good condition on the inside. Um, it's not actually very dusty at all. There's a bit of dust there, as you can see, but it's actually pretty good. I normally expect to see these to be filthy on the inside. Just a sheet, a carpet of dust across of everything is quite common. Um, and it's one of the contributing factors toward failing hard drives in these. iMacs cook their hard drives, which is why hard drive failure in them is so common, despite the fact that all it does is sit on a desk its whole life. Like, for example, three and a half inch drives don't really fail very often because they don't move around, whereas laptop hard drives fail all the time because they're getting bumped about in a laptop all the time. And they're shock sensitive. Um, however, in any case, I'm still going to dust this out. I'm going to use my air compressor to do this. Um, you could use a can of compressed air or one of these um, uh, or one of these computer electric duster blower outer things, which I've still yet to test. Um, but yeah, either way, I'm going to take this out of the back, give it a blast with the air compressor. I'm going to aim for the fan. I'm going to give the whole thing just a quick once over. Um, I'm going to aim for I'm going to aim for the vent on the back here, blow some air in there. And lastly, I'll go up and blow some air through all of these vents along the bottom. And that will all eject any dust that's in the computer out of the computer. So I shall be right back. Now I have given this a dust out. It's nice and clean inside. Uh, so we need to prepare the edges for the new adhesive. So um, you'll need some kind of scraper tool for this. I do it with my fingernails because I don't bite my fingernails. So I have fingernails that I can use for fingernail things. And I can literally just scrape this off. Uh, if you are not a fingernail person, you will need some kind of scraper. But if you get a little bit of a lead going here, you can then just peel it off like that. And it's actually pretty easy to do. So I'll just go around the edges of the screen and then we'll be back down to just bare plastic. The SSD that we're going to be putting in this thing, I'm using a Crucial MX500 uh, in 1000 gigabytes, so one terabyte. Um, now, this drive has been around for ages, but it's still basically the best two and a half inch SSD, in my opinion. Um, I think some of the old Samsung Evos, like the Evo 850, I think, uh, is slightly faster. But being Samsung, it's also more expensive. This drive, um, especially the one terabyte, like as of recording this, this one terabyte drive is available for like seventy pounds. I'm not sure what it's available, what the US dollar version. <clears throat> I'm not sure what the US dollar version of it is available for at the moment, but it's ridiculously cheap for what you're getting. So uh, to get this ready, we're just going to simply slap on the rubber bumpers. Uh, and then we need to fit this into the iMac. Now this fitting bit is kind of awkward because the connector is on a very short cable. Um, one method that I've had quite a lot of luck with recently is just to undo these two screws holding the left speaker in place so the speaker can move around. And this allows you to just get a bit more access to that cable. It is more than possible to um, to get the SSD connected in by using like a prime tool to press the connector into the back and stuff like that. However, the past couple of times I've done this is just loosen off this speaker and just have that hanging out a little bit. And it's just given me just a bit more space to get behind that connector. So now I can put the SSD in position. And now I've got just enough access behind just to move that connector into place and plug it in. There we go. And now we'll just slot that speaker back into place and screw it back in again. 
And normally, if I try and do that without loosening off the speaker, I usually spend about five or 10 minutes fumbling around trying to get that connected to go into the drive and then get the drive in here and so on. So uh, I found this is actually a very effective method to fit it. Now we can stick these guys back on as well. When you're putting this one in place, just watch this little wire here. This comes from the power on button. So the power on button is buried down the back of the iMac behind this speaker, right down the back. And it comes around and plugs into the power supply there. So just make sure that that doesn't get pinched when you put this in place and screw it down. And then from your screw selection, uh, you've got the super long boy, that goes there. You've got the short boy, that goes up here. And then these two guys that are the same length go on this side. So our SSD is now fitted and we've cleaned up the edges of the screen and uh, I've also cleaned up the edges on the LCD itself. I've peeled off the remaining of the wrap. Same way, just fingernail that off or use a plastic scraping tool. Uh, now, unfortunately, at this point of the video, I realized that this idiot completely forgot to get 21 and a half inch adhesive strips. So I only have 27 inch adhesive strips. Um, I'm going to use the two long ones and I'm going to cut them to length because I'm not throwing out this video at this point of the recording just because I've got the wrong length strips. Um, so I'm aware that at the start of this, I said about doing it properly. Now you can still use um, the wrong size strips and you can just cut them to length. It's having this type of adhesive strip, which is the important bit. Um, and you know, on a, ideally you want to get the correct length ones because then they'll all fit perfectly and you don't have to do any cutting. However, it's basically zero issue just to do a little bit of cutting to fit on these if you get caught short with the wrong length strips in stock. So that's what I'm gonna do here. So uh, I shall put this to one side and I'm going to start fitting these up. So uh, I'll take these out of the thing. So there's uh, a load of different ones. So as you can see, we've got um, this one here uh, goes up the side and that fits over the Wi-Fi antennas there and there. And again, being slightly too long, I just need to chop off the top and chop off the bottom and that will fit just fine. Uh, then there's another one that goes, this one also has an antenna sticky outy bit on it. So that is gonna go there. And again, I'll just nick the end off there so it's the right length. Then there is a couple of long bits that go, that one's gonna go down the side. And then we've got another one that goes across the top there. And basically just puzzle match everything up into position. Um, and finally, we've got the two strips that go on the bottom that have the tabs that stick up. So again, we're gonna put those down the bottom. So I'm gonna go ahead and stick all of these on now. I recommend sticking them to the iMac itself because that way you don't have to worry about the positioning because you can see that they are exactly on the plastic uh, sort of mounts as it were. So I'm gonna go ahead and start working on this. Here we go. You can buy these um, adhesive strips on eBay or Amazon. Uh, they're annoyingly expensive. Um, however, considering the easy profit that you can make doing this job, um, I, consider it, I consider it to be a very acceptable expense. Um, in an ideal world, you could probably order them in bulk from somewhere. Uh, I haven't bothered looking yet, if I'm honest. Um, but yeah, I usually expect to pay, I don't know, five quid for a set or something like that. Um, so yeah, and once again, I'm just gonna chop off any excess. I'm not gonna take off the front bit yet. We're gonna leave that right to the last minute and I'll explain why when we get there.
And for these bottom pieces, you want to make these slightly inset, just so the tab sticks up just into the middle of the iMac. If I'm honest, I often leave the bottom one Now that's done, we're ready to put the screen back on. Now, um, the reason why I said don't take off uh, the other bits quite yet is what I recommend doing and what I tend to do if I'm not feeling super brave is I'll mount the screen up and connect up the connectors and then I'll just put some masking tape around the edge just to hold the screen in place and I will move forward to doing the software side of it and I'll go into the macOS setup and essentially just go to disk utility and make sure that the SSD is detected. Uh, and I go that far in just so I can see that the, 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 the SSD is detected and everything is okay. Then I turn it off again, take the masking tape off, do the peel and stick it on for realsies. And that just gives me that last confirmation that everything is okay before I commit. Um, however, most of the time, because I've done this several times, I'm feeling brave and for the sake of this video, I'm going to go straight in for the commit. So we are going to commit to this and I'm going to peel off all of the backing tape. But as I say, if you're feeling a bit nervous about doing this, at this point you can just put the screen on, masking tape it in place and just make sure that everything is detected before you go for reals. Obviously, the penalty for it not working is you have to then cut through your new adhesive strips um, and start again, basically. Uh, but that's not the worst thing in the world, it's just a nuisance. And the little tabs, I'm just going to push them back against the back of the iMac just so they don't stick to the screen itself. And we're going to go in bottom first. rest that in place and I'm just going to check that we're aligned left and right. Just nudge that along just so it's perfectly centered. I think that's pretty good. Now I need to get in there and connect up the cables. There we go. And one last check. I think we're as good as we're going to get. I mean, at this point, I've basically committed, so I may as well go the whole hog now. So what I'll do is I'll get this microfiber cloth, and I use that and just grip both sides and just press it all into place. Just go around the sides, pressing together as I do so. And that's it. We are now committed, and as you can see, we have a factory perfect finish. You'd never know that someone had been in there. Beautiful. So now we're ready to turn this on and start the software side of it. So let's get some power hooked up to it. So I've got power, keyboard and mouse hooked up to it and I'm going to plug in my MacOS Monterey flash drive. Uh, I think this has got Monterey on it anyway. We'll find out in a minute. Plug that into the back and we'll turn it on. So it's going to boot from that Monterey flash drive because it's got nowhere else to start from. However, you could also hold down the Option key on the keyboard to force it onto the boot menu. Um, if you're going to sit and wait for it like I'm doing here though, don't be surprised if it takes it, you know, a, a, an amount of time to respond like it's doing now because it's looking for its old hard drive and it has to wait for that to time out before it goes, okay, what else have I got? And then it'll find the flash drive and boot from that. If you don't have a MacOS flash drive pre-prepared, um, then you can do that on another machine. Um, do a Google search for how to make a MacOS bootable drive. Uh, there's lots of guides on doing that um, and a bit outside the scope of this video. Or failing that, if you're completely stuck, um, look up how to do internet recovery. Um, and you can do internet recovery where the Mac will download the installation files over the internet. You'll get an old version of MacOS if you do this, 
but you can do the internet recovery, get macOS on there, and then just uh, sequentially upgrade it all the way up to the version that you actually want. Uh, we've got our flash drive going now, so that is now booting. Um, so we'll just wait for this to start up and then we can go into disk utility and check that everything is okay. Please excuse me just doing the camera pointing at screen thing, but for this current setup it's just the easiest way to do it. So we have booted into it and the first thing I want to do is go to disk utility and hit continue and I want to make sure that our SSD is detected. Um, so I can already see up here that it has appeared. Just for, just for clarity, I click on view and do show all devices and this actually shows you the tree of partitions on each drive which makes disk utility make a lot more sense. So from here I'm going to select our one terabyte SSD and just hit erase and I'm just going to call it Mac OS and I'm going to leave all the format and schemes at the defaults. Um, this is Monterey and it's automatically going for APFS as the format uh, and GUID. On older versions of macOS you'll probably find that it auto selects uh, macOS extended, uh, probably macOS extended journaled for a system drive. When you actually install macOS it may convert it uh, afterwards but if it needs to do that it will do it automatically. My, my strong advice is to leave this at the defaults and just let Mac, the macOS installer that you're running decide which format is best for the system drive. It will automatically select what it wants and if it wants to convert it, it will. So don't fret about what selections you make here, just leave them at the defaults. So erase, that is all done. So now I'm going to quit out of disk utility and we're going to hit install macOS Monterey. At this point you might be going, oh, could I restore from Time Machine? Uh, yes, you probably could. Um, however, my advice and what I'm going to do is I prefer to do a clean install of macOS and then use the migration assistant to import the user data. Uh, this has some pros and cons which I'll talk about when we get there, but I generally find that it's more reliable overall. Restoring directly from Time Machine tends to be, it can sometimes be a bit hit and miss. Although if you're working with exactly the same version of macOS, it's probably going to work most of the time. In any case, I'm going to use Migration Assistant, so we're going to go for a clean install of macOS and just get the computer up and running. Right, off it goes. I shall see you once we get to the first run wizard. We're ready to go. Uh, I just pulled the hard drive off of the testing rig uh, and it did actually pass a long test. So this hard drive is not actually failing. However, as I mentioned, I don't particularly care. I have already upsold the customer on replacing the hard drive with an SSD because it will make this thing so much faster. It doesn't actually matter if the hard drive is failing or not. And for that reason, make sure that when you're talking to your clients, don't sell someone an SSD upgrade based on the assumption that the hard drive has failed. Work on upselling an SSD because it's going to make their computer significantly faster. Because, as I say, if the hard drive has failed, it's failed. But if it hasn't failed, you should still replace it because it's a hard drive and hard drives are awful. So yeah, if you work from that perspective, it doesn't particularly matter what state the hard drive is in. However, just for reference, this one had not actually failed. Anyway, I've just plugged it into the back of this using the um, uh, dock that I showed you earlier on. So we're going to United Kingdom and we're going to just continue with mostly default settings. And I will connect it to the internet because I can and it can get updates and stuff. And now at this point, I'm going to select to do the migration assistant. If you want to, you can just hit not now in the bottom corner here and just skip through to a blank desktop and just create a new user account. But if you're importing user data from the old drive, which I think most of us will be, we're going to say we're moving in from a Mac Time Machine or a startup disk, which is what we have. Now, if your hard drive is in a state of failure, you may or may not have, you might have mixed success doing the migration assistant like this. Most of the time, if the computer was trying to start up or you know, if it was starting up but just running really badly, you can probably get away with just doing this, selecting your startup disk and just trying to import the data on it. And I find that nine times out of 10 this works and you don't have to do any kind of exotic data recovery. 
If the drive is not mounting or it's completely shot to hell or something like that, you're going to need to look into recovering the data on another computer and then importing it later. And there's various ways of approaching this, but I'm not going to go into that because that's a bit outside the scope of that of this video. Now we're talking data recovery, and if you're doing that, you're not going to use Migration Assistant. You're going to create a blank user account and bring in customer data afterwards. So for now, we're just going to hit continue. And it's going to start calculating how much space everything is going to take. This can take forever. I know it's all going to fit on there because we've got the same size drive that was there previously. So I'm just going to hit continue and I'm going to select to import everything. You can be selective here if you want. Um, however, I want this computer to be basically exactly as the customer left it when they brought it into the shop. So I'm going to import everything as is. And when we use Migration Assistant in this way, we have to set people's passwords again. So I'm just going to put in the customer's password. And we're ready to go. And off it goes. So uh, this import will take an amount of time depending on how much data you've got to import and what kind of condition the drive is in. Uh, because this drive isn't failing and I've got it on a USB 3 enclosure that is quite a fast one, we should be able to achieve somewhere around about um, 20, probably about an average of 20 to 25 megabytes per second um, in, in my experience. We've got about two or 300 gigs of data to copy. So this is going to take a few hours minimum. Um, if you were importing from a faster drive or something like that, it might go faster or some, a lot of people, um, I do often encounter people who just don't have a lot of stuff on their computer and there may only be like 50, maybe 60 gigs of data and you might be done in half an hour. But in any case, now is a good time to get the computer comfortable um, and make sure to check in on it now and then and, you know, just come in and tap the shift or control key on the keyboard just to keep it awake so you can keep an eye on what's going on. That's what I would advise doing. Um, but yeah, this is going to take a while. So I'm going to go ahead and hit stop recording now and we'll come back to this when we're all done. And we should be returning to a, a computer that is basically ready to go. Right, one infinitely long bar later and a couple of reboots and we are done. So I'm going to go ahead and hit done. And we should now hit the login screen. Right, and there we have it. We're literally exactly where we started again, except now there's an SSD in there instead of a hard drive. And we can verify this from the About This Mac screen where it now shows us a solid state SATA drive instead of a hard drive. Um, so you will find after doing this that various things will want logging in again. You'll need to sign into iCloud again, or rather your client will need to sign into iCloud again. Uh, there may be a couple of other things that will throw hissy fits and throw up stuff that you need to resolve. Um, uh, I would also highly recommend, again, if it's um, someone else's computer, just go through and open the Mail app, open the Photos app, open iTunes, and just check that those open and update correctly. And then lastly, don't forget to actually check for any system updates that are available as well. Uh, in this case, this seems to have done them all while, uh, while I went away and left it to do things. So... Uh, there's no more to do with this. This one is ready to go. And that is how you put an SSD into an iMac, everyone. So thank you very much for tuning in. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and that's all. See you in the next video. Bye.